Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on the halogen. Now, before you watch this, make sure you're confident and comfortable with the previous material uh, on electron configuration, on ionic bonding, on the alkali metals, and on acids and bases. And there are videos on all of those things earlier in this playlist if you need to catch up. Now, in this video, we are going to look at what the halogens are, their reaction with hydrogen, then their reaction with metals, then their reactivity, and then we'll look at their displacement reactions, and finally, we'll look at how to make predictions for another halogen called astatine. So what are the halogens? The halogens are the elements in group seven of the periodic table. That is fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Now, these are all non-metals that form diatomic molecules. Diatomic just means a two atom molecule. So our first one, for example, is fluorine, which has F2 molecules made of two fluorine atoms. Now, it is a pale yellow gas. We can see fluorine up here. There's our F2. Now, clearly that there is a liquid. Um, and the reason why is because it's such a pale yellow um, that if I showed you the gas, it would just look like an empty test tube. So this is actually liquid fluorine at about minus 200 degrees Celsius. Um, our next one down is chlorine, Cl2, um, which is a yellow green gas. And we see that here in that vial there. Then we've got bromine, Br2. This is a red-brown liquid, one of only two liquid elements, the other being mercury. So here's our bromine, Br2. You can see that really deep, rich, reddy brown colour of the bromine sloshing around in that bottle there. And the last one we've got is iodine, which is I2. And this is a dark, shiny solid, which we can see up here. Now, there are a couple of trends that we need to know with the halogens, and we've seen them already. But as we go down the group, the melting and boiling points increase. So we, we can see we've got fluorine with the lowest boiling point, and then we've got iodine with the highest boiling point, And that's why they're changing from being gases to solid as we go down the group. Our second one is the colours. The colours get darker as we go down the group. So fluorine is this really light pale colour and iodine is this really dark rich colour and there's a gradual variation as we go down. Now, all of the halogens have seven electrons in their outer shells and the reason why is because they're in group seven and the group tells us the number of electrons in their outer shells. Now, we're only going to illustrate this for fluorine and chlorine because you do not need to be able to draw electron configurations for elements with more than 20 electrons, which both bromine and iodine have. So let's look at fluorine. Uh, fluorine is here. It's got an atomic number of nine. So it has two electrons in its first shell and then seven in its outer shell with a gap here that will want to accept electrons in a second. Again, we've got chlorine now. Chlorine's got an atomic number of 17. It's one group, uh, so one period lower than uh, fluorine. So it's got one more shell, two electrons in the first shell, eight in the second shell, and seven in that final shell. Again, with a gap there that will want to accept an electron when we form ions. So all of these um, halogens will gain one electron when they form ions to form these X minus, X represents the halogen, X minus ions, which we call halides. So the fluorine ion is called fluoride, chlorine is called chloride, bromine is called bromide, iodine is called iodide. So that IDE ending tells us that we've got a negative ion. And doing this, gaining that one electron, completes their outer shells. That's why they do this in the first place. So for fluorine, fluorine will gain an electron to form um, an F minus ion. It's got a single negative charge, and that red one, that is the electron that's being gained. And now we've got a complete outer shell configuration of 2.8. And similar for chlorine, it's going to gain an electron again to form a negative ion. Again, the red one there is the electron we've gained. And now the um, electron configuration for that ion is a nice, complete, stable 2.8.8. .8. OK, so how do the halogens react with hydrogen? Well always the same way. A hydrogen, hydrogen and a halogen react together to make a hydrogen halide. So for example, we might have hydrogen reacting with chlorine to make hydrogen chloride. 
Now, we need to know that we need to be able to do a, a simple equation for this as well. So let's work out our formula for hydrogen chloride. Hydrogen forms H plus ions. We've seen on the previous slide that chloride forms Cl or is a Cl minus ion. And so therefore, we'll just need one of each and our formula will be HCl. One plus to balance out one minus. So then our symbol equation will look like this. H2, that's hydrogen gas and Cl2, our chlorine, reacting together to make HCl. And there will be two HCls to give us two hydrogens and two chlorines for the two hydrogens and two chlorines on the left. Let's do similar for hydrogen and bromine. They're going to react together to make hydrogen bromide. And again, if we will try and work out our formula, hydrogen is an H plus ion. Bromide, we've seen on the previous slide, is the Br minus ion. So therefore, one positive and one negative will cancel each other out. So our formula will be just HBr, like that. And so our symbol equation will be H2 plus Br2, making two HBrs for the same reason as we just saw. Now, really importantly, hydrogen halides dissolve in water to form acidic solutions. You've met one of these before, you just might not realise it. So let's have a look. Um, hydrogen fluoride, for example, it dissolves to make hydrofluoric acid. Hydrogen chloride dissolves to make hydrochloric acid. Hydrogen bromide dissolves in water to make hydrobromic acid. And hydrogen iodide reacts in water or dissolves in water to make hydroiodic acid. So all of these um, hydrogen halides form acidic solutions. And actually the strongest one of those is the hydrogen iodide, uh, the hydro, hydroiodic acid, which is a super, super strong acid. So what about the reaction of halogens with metals? Um, a metal and a halogen react together to make a metal halide. For example, if our metal is sodium and our halogen is chlorine, then our metal halide will be sodium chloride. And you can see that reaction happening here. You can see that little lump of grey sodium metal at the bottom reacting with the green gas surrounding it. And you can see how much energy is being given off as that reaction uh, proceeds. Now, let's think about the balanced symbol equation for this reaction. We need to work out our formula for sodium chloride first. Now, we've seen from the alkali metals video, because it's in group one, sodium forms an Na plus ion. We've seen already this video that because chlorine is in group seven, it forms Cl minus ions. One positive and one negative charge will cancel each other out. So therefore, our formula for sodium chloride will be NaCl. And so that gives us these symbols in our equation. Na for sodium, Cl2 for chlorine, and NaCl. So now all we need to do is balance it. Um, start with the chlorine. There's two chlorines on the left and only one on the right. So if we put a two in front of NaCl, that now means we've got two lots of the chlorine there as well. But now we, our sodium's unbalanced. So if I put a two in front of sodium there, now that balances. So two Na's and Cl2 makes two NaCl's. Let's look now at calcium reacting with fluorine. So calcium's our metal, fluorine's our halogen, and so our metal halide will be calcium fluoride. Again, let's think about our formula for calcium fluoride. Now, calcium is in group two, so it will form a Ca2 plus ion because it will lose two outer shell electrons. Fluorine, we've seen already, is in group seven, so it will form F minus ions. So to balance out the two pluses, we need a second F minus, and that means our formula will be CaF2. So our equation will look like this. Ca plus F2 makes CaF2. We've got one calcium left, one on the right, two fluorines left, two fluorines right. So that is already balanced. And our last example is aluminium and bromine reacting to make aluminium bromide. So um, aluminium is our metal, bromine is our uh, halogen, and they react together to make our hydrogen, uh, our metal halide, um, aluminium bromide. We can see that happening here. And again, you can see how much energy is being, being given off as the red bromine in there reacts with some aluminium foil, producing that nice fountain of sparks. Now, again, let's think about our formulas. So 
Aluminium is in group three. It's got three electrons in its outer shell. It will lose those to form an Al3 plus ion. We've seen already that bromine is in group seven. So it's a halogen, it will form Br minus ions. So to balance out those three pluses, we're gonna need three bromides to give us three negative charges. So therefore, our formula will be AlBr3. That will look a little bit like this. Now, this is quite a hard one to balance. So um, what we really want to do is look for the lowest common multiple of the two bromines on the left and the three on the right. The lowest common multiple of two and three is six, which means that if I put a three in front of that bromine, I get six bromines on the left. If I put a two in front of AlBr3, that gives me six bromines on the right. And the last thing to do then is just put a two in front of the aluminium to balance that out as well. So what about the reactivity of the halogens? Now, before we think about that, it's just worth reminding ourselves about the reactivity of the alkali metals. Now with them, as we go down the group, the alkali metals get more reactive. Why is that? Well, as we go down the group, you get more electron shells, which means that the outer electrons are further away from the nucleus, which means that there's less attraction to that positive nucleus, which means it's easier to remove the electrons, which makes the alkali metals more reactive. Now, with the halogens, we're going to see that same logic about the distance between the outer electrons and the amount of attraction. That will be important, but it will have the opposite effects in terms of the reactivity because the halogens will be gaining electrons rather than losing electrons. So let's have a look at this. What we see with the halogens is that as we go down the group, they get less reactive. So fluorine at the top of the group is the most reactive, then chlorine, then bromine, then iodine at the bottom of the group is the least reactive. So why is this? Well, when halogens react, they gain electrons to form anions. We can see that here, X2 representing our diatomic fluorine molecule, gaining two electrons to form two X minus halide ions. Now, anything that increases the attraction between the nucleus and the outer electrons will make the halogens more reactive because the more readily they attract those electrons, the more readily they will react with things. So therefore, as we go down the group, the number of electron shells increases. So if we compare fluorine to chlorine, fluorine's got two electron shells, where bromine has three electron shells. That means that the outer shells are, or the outer shell electrons are further from the nucleus. We can see that here. Let's look at the distance between fluorine's outer shell and its nucleus compared with chlorine's outer shell and the nucleus. We can see that clearly the distance to chlorine's outer shell is greater than it is for fluorine. So therefore, that means in chlorine, the electrons are less attracted to the nucleus than they are in fluorine. What that means is chlorine will attract electrons less strongly. That therefore means that chlorine will be less reactive because it's going to attract electrons to it less strongly. And that's why that as we go down the group, the halogens become less reactive. Now, the last reaction with the halogens that we want to think about is the displacement reactions. Now, a displacement reaction is when a more reactive halogen displaces the ions of the less reactive halogen from solutions of halide salts. So let's look at a couple of examples. Um, example number one is fluorine, which is a halogen, reacting with sodium iodide, which is our halide salt. And in this case, they will react and make sodium fluoride and iodine. Now what's happened is the fluorine has displaced the iodine from the iodide. And the reason this works is because the fluorine is more reactive and the iodine is less reactive so the more reactive uh, halogen has displaced the less reactive halogen. Example number two, we've got calcium bromide reacting with chlorine to make calcium chloride and bromine. And again, in this case, the chlorine has displaced the bromine from the calcium bromide 
to make that calcium chloride. And this works again because chlorine, the halogen on its own as an element, is more reactive and the bromine is less reactive. So the chlorine is able to displace that bromine. What about some non-examples? We're going to look at these. These don't work because the halogen is less reactive than the halide ions. So example number one, bromine trying to react with potassium fluoride. No reaction happens. And the reason why is because the bromine is less reactive and the fluorine is more reactive. And a less reactive substance cannot displace a more reactive substance. Similarly, if we've got magnesium bromide and iodine, Iodine, the halogen, is less reactive, and bromide, the halide, is more reactive. And so again, the, more rea the uh, less reactive substance cannot displace a more reactive substance. Now we can use displacement reactions to determine the order of reactivity of our halogens. Um, and it works something like this. So we start with solutions of halogens, and we add those to solutions of halide salts. So our halogens will have aqueous solutions of chlorine, bromine and iodine. And our halide salts will be aqueous solutions of sodium chloride, sodium bromide and sodium iodide. They don't have to be sodium salts. They could be potassium salts or something else. But we work with sodium salts just for convenience. So we do it in a dropping tile like this. So we start with our halide salts already in place. So our first column here is our sodium chloride our second column is our sodium bromide and our third column is our sodium iodide okay now what we're going to do is in the first row we'll be adding our chlorine solution in our second row we'll add our bromine solution and in our third row we'll add our iodine solution and when we do this if there is a reaction it means the halogen is the more reactive um, one and if there is no reaction it means the halogen is the less reactive one so let's actually have a look at um, how this works in practice so you can see there our halogen is being added to our halide salts and you can see sometimes there's a color change and sometimes there isn't okay let's just look at look that through one more time so again we've got our first row is sodium chloride bromide and iodide we're adding iodine second row we're adding bromine and third row we're adding the chlorine and the results of these reactions can tell us the order of reactivity. So let's have a look at this. Now, if there is no reaction, it means the halogen is less reactive. Now, in this first row, there is no color change in any of those. They all just stayed that brown color. OK, so what that tells us is that the iodine didn't react. So the iodine is less reactive than um, both the bromine and the chlorine. In our second row, there was no color change here, but this one has got a nice dark color indicating a really clear color change. In that case, that was iodine that was being produced. So what this tells us is that the bromine, the bromine was more reactive than the iodine because it did displace it, but it was less reactive than the chlorine because it didn't displace it and then lastly if we look at the top row there was no reaction there no color change at all you can see here there is a very faint color change so there was a reaction there so chlorine did displace the sodium bromide and it also reacted with the iodine as well and got that reaction there so from these we can see that chlorine could displace both the bromine and the iodine so chlorine was the most reactive we saw that the iodine couldn't displace anything, so it was the least reactive. And then we saw that bromine displaced one of them, but not the other. So that was the middle one. 
and so our order of reactivity is chlorine then bromine then iodine and that shouldn't surprise us because that goes in order down the group and we saw a couple of slides ago that the halogens get m less reactive as you go down the group. Now the last thing on displacement reactions is a bit of higher tier material where we consider them in terms of redox which remember is reduction and oxidation reactions. Now um, in redox we have this mnemonic oil rig which helps us remember what is going on so it tells us that oxidation is losing electrons and reduction is gaining electrons and what we'll see is that in a displacement reaction the halogen atom uh, gets reduced so it gains electrons and the halide ion gets oxidized because it loses electrons. Now the halogen atom uh, the one that's being reduced is the more reactive halogen and the halide ion that's being oxidized is our less reactive halogen. Okay now let's look at some work examples so first one is fluorine and sodium iodide reacting together to make sodium fluoride and iodine. Now we don't need to worry about doing full balanced equations of these, but let's just think about what's happening to the fluorine, the fluoride, the iodide, and the iodine. So fluorine is this, it's F2, or we can just consider it as F. Um, we'll look at both examples in a second. And it's producing fluoride ions, F minus. The sodium iodide is I minus, and it's becoming iodine, which is I2. Or again, we could just consider it in terms of being I atoms. We'll look at the simpler case um, with the F and the I, and then we'll look at the harder case with F2 and I2. Now, let's start with fluorine. So fluorine is starting out as F, and it is becoming F minus, like that. So in order for fluorine to become fluoride, to become F minus, it must be gaining an electron. So that is reduction, because it has gained an electron. Now we know from previous slides that fluorine actually exists as F2 molecules so it's more correct to write it this way to say um, F2 will gain two electrons to become two F minus ions like that. Um, in terms of what you write in the exam it doesn't actually matter uh, mark schemes generally give full marks for either version so I would if I was you, do whichever one you are most comfortable with and whichever one you think you're most likely to remember in an exam situation. And we can see similar will happen with the um, iodide. So the iodide is starting out as I minus and it is becoming iodine like that. So it is losing an electron. So we show that like this. So it becomes the iodide ion becomes I and an electron. This is an oxidation because the I minus has lost the electron to become I. And again, more correctly, we should probably write it like this. So we can say two I minuses are reacting to produce one I2 molecule and two electrons like that. Again, it doesn't matter which one you write in the exam. Um, go with whichever you're most comfortable and confident with. Let's look at a second example then, which is calcium bromide. Um, reacting with chlorine to produce calcium chloride and bromine. Now, again, just looking at the bromine, the bromine here is starting out as Br- and it is becoming um, bromine molecules, Br2, or we could think about it in terms of just bromine atoms. It's less correct that way, but it's also a bit easier to get your head around. So similar with the chlorine, starting out as Cl2, or just Cl for sake of ease, and it's forming chloride Cl minus like that. So again, if we do our half equations, think about the bromine. The bromine is starting out as Br minus, and it's becoming bromine like that, um, and the electron that we've just lost. So that is an oxidation because the bromide has lost electrons. Remember, oxidation is lost. And more correctly, we should probably write it like this. So two Br minuses making Br2, because bromine forms the Br2 molecule, rather, just, rather than just bromine atoms, and those two electrons here as well. And we can do similar for the chlorine. So for the chlorine, 
it's starting out as Cl. It is going to form Cl minus, and it does that by gaining an electron like that. Um, and so that is a reduction because the chlorine has gained an electron to form those chloride Cl minus ions. And again, more correctly, we should probably write it as Cl2 gaining two electrons to form two Cl minuses. But again, it doesn't matter which you do in the exam because both will get the full credit. So the last thing to look at in this presentation is astatine. Now you're probably wondering what astatine is. Astatine is the fifth halogen. So it's the one below iodine in the group. It is a highly radioactive substance that's never actually been seen as a solid sample because it breaks down super quickly due to its crazy high uh, radioactivity. Now, you don't need to know anything about astatine, but you do need to be able to make predictions about it in terms of what would its properties be based on what you already know about the halogens. So we're going to look at how you can answer questions on this. So predicting its properties. First of all, its physical properties. Um, you can predict that it will be solid. And the reason we know that is because the melting point increases as we go down the group. We know that fluorine is a gas, chlorine is a gas, bromine is a liquid, iodine is a solid. So the one after iodine, we should also expect to be a solid. Similarly, we'd expect it to be dark coloured. And the reason why is because the colour of the halogens darkens as you go down the group. You start with very pale, uh, almost colourless fluorine and end up with that very dark, shiny iodine. So again, we would expect acetine after iodine to be even darker. In terms of the chemical reactivity, because hydrogens, so uh, halogens react with hydrogen to make hydrogen halides, we should expect hydrogen and acetine to give us hydrogen astatide. Astatide is the AT minus ion. In terms of the reaction with metals, um, a metal plus a halogen makes a metal halide. So if we had sodium metal and a halogen, it would be sodium astatide as the metal that we make. And in terms of displacement reactions, because uh, astatine is lower down the group than, um, than iodine, we would expect it to be the least reactive halogen because the halogens get less reactive as you go down the group. So that would mean that astatine cannot displace any halides from their salts. And equally, all the other halogens can displace acetine from its salts. So that's a little summary for how you go about this with acetine. It's not about memorizing what acetine's properties are, but, uh, but about working out what they should be based on what you know about the trends and patterns in group seven. So that's it for the end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.